Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, December 6th, 1933, Ulysses can enter the United States. This is based on a really fascinating court ruling, not one about immigration, but one about the book Ulysses by James Joyce. Over the previous five years or so, the book had been basically officially barred from being imported and distributed in the United States because it was deemed too obscene. So in this ruling, as the New York Times put it, Judge John M. Woolsey concluded that, quote, Joyce's stream of consciousness study of everyday life in Dublin was many things, brilliant and dull, intelligible and obscure, honest and disgusting. The one thing it was not, he ruled, was obscene. The case was actually called, I love this, United States versus one book called Ulysses. And there are also tons of other really fascinating tidbits in here. It also, of course, set a precedent and gets at all sorts of questions about art and obscenity, censorship, free speech. So here to discuss one book called Ulysses is, as always, Nicole Hammer of Columbia. Hello, Nikki. Hi, Jody. And our special guest for this episode, someone we've been trying to get on the show for a long time, one of my favorite people, authors and radio hosts, Kurt Anderson. Kurt, Welcome to the show. Hello, both of you. Happy to be here. And I will plug your latest book. Uh, is called Evil Geniuses. The previous book, fantastic work, is called Fantasyland. But we are here to talk about one book, Ulysses. And Kurt, I'm giving you the task of um, summarizing Ulysses for our listeners. <laughs> well, that'll take the rest of the 20 minutes. No, there is obviously a long way to summarize this very long book. And there's a short way. The short way, I guess, would be to say it is the thoughts that go through the mind and some of the behavior that happens in the lives mainly of two guys, Stephen Dedalus and Leopold Bloom, and also some women, Molly Bloom and others. Uh, on one day, June 16th, 1904 in Dublin. Um, and uh, that's it. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, that's noting. Yes. Um, and then I will ask you kind of having looked into this story and understood this moment in history, is it surprising to you that Ulysses is the book around which these questions of obscenity start to get played out? Well, it was useful in the history that followed because it was such, as Judge Wolsey said, uh, a non-pornographic work of art, work of high art, work of abstruse, obscure, difficult art. So it clearly, I mean, even in 1922 or 1934 even, was not intended to arouse the passions or allow people to do what, in fact, at one point in the book, Leopold Bloom does, which is to jerk off. Um, uh, so no, it, it, it wasn't surprising, but it, it's good because it wasn't one of these cases where, oh, this is bad, or this is not quite art, or this is whatever, but we have to rule anyway. It was, it, it sort of, to the degree it created, I think, a legal umbrella for okaying more freedom of artistic expression and speech. It used this sort of non game sayable work of art as the pretext. Yeah, that this was very much a literary creation that was pioneering a relatively new style, this stream of consciousness. So there was a very easy way to slot it into the history of literary arts. Right. And and Woolsey, it's interesting, I didn't know anything about him until you invited me to this and read about him. This is what he's famous for. But he was this, you know, he lived in New York City, he'd gone to Columbia and Yale. It was 1934, America was becoming sophisticated and having modern artists and modern literature made by Americans. So this was the moment when a guy like that, a federal judge in New York City, is going to say, come on, 
this isn't pornographic or this isn't obscene. And, and, and he did. I mean, it was an interesting hinge moment because I, I immediately thought, well, what else happened a moment later than following spring is the Hayes Code in Hollywood, which was the famous before and after moment that actually did the opposite. It restricted all the you know sexiness and raciness that was allowed to exist for a few years in sound movies for you know five or seven years, and then uh uh-uh, uh we're not gonna we're, we're gonna stop that. And of course, the same week I think prohibition was ended, right? Yeah. So so it was a funny moment of of freeing up, but not so fast in Hollywood. And and so it was an ongoing conversation in a, in a kind of big American way. I do want to get to that larger conversation and then the legacy of that but but you know yeah. just sticking on the dirty um, words in Ulysses the dirty words in Ulysses <laughs> exactly but Nikki I mean what is because I'm having a hard time figuring out exactly what it was that led to the actual banning of Ulysses I mean it was published in Paris and it was serialized here in the United States and then I think when this scene that Kurt referred to this masturbation scene comes out um you know the government freaks out and is and but like I just don't know why pick a fight with Ulysses of all the books. Maybe. You know, it's hard to say why it was exactly Ulysses, but you have to remember that the 1920s is still part of this roiling culture war in the United States. And so to a certain extent, people are on the lookout for <laughs> battles to have. It's a it's an era where um, sexual mores are starting to loosen up. Women are starting to wear like shorter skirts and show more skin and dating culture is changing. But you also have this progressive era that wasn't actually all that culturally progressive. That was all about controlling vices. Um, And prohibition was a big part of that. We're talking about this era in which people couldn't drink hard liquor, um, or at least couldn't legally drink hard liquor. And so Ulysses falls into that roiling culture war where you're going to have somebody step in and say, no, you can't actually have a scene of masturbation being published in a magazine in the United States. And the Manhattan district attorney made sure that it wasn't going to circulate. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, again, also Random House set out to do this, right? This new Mm -hmm. publishing house, my publishing house, as a matter of fact, Random House and its famous founder, uh, Bennett Cerf, you know, wanted to be the publisher of this book that had been published, you know, in Paris for more than a decade earlier. And so he, you know, paid uh, James Joyce, not so much, I think 1500, the equivalent of like 30 grand today to publish in the US. And he and Joyce knew this yeah. would be good. And they had to kind of force the issue to get a customs guy to, to confiscate it and say, oh, okay, fine. And have it be prosecuted, which of course was for this giant, obscure novel by an Irishman who, that had been published in France 12 years ago was the greatest promotional stunt uh, practically of all time. Yeah. And all of a sudden people are sneaking in copies of this and it becomes this, I mean, it, you know, just it's a story it plays out over and over you try and ban something and it just becomes that much exactly and what's interesting is i I, again i didn't know that it had been reviewed when it was published in the new york times at length um by a guy who thought you know too boring and disgusting but he was a shrink and so it taught him a lot about crazy people uh he, he said in his review in the new york times but but uh it was like so many things like the scopes trial you know nine years earlier or eight years earlier it was a stunt. It was it was an attempt to have a constitutional test, and we had it, and free speech won. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the way in which free speech won. Um, what is your reading, Nikki, of why Ulysses was not deemed obscene by this judge? Well, so we should point out that it was a pretty narrow win in a lot of ways. I mean, the, the person who's prosecuting this, the lawyer for Random House, Morris Ernst, is an ACLU lawyer. And so he wants to make a civil liberties case. But ultimately, you know, you read the title of the case, Jody, United States versus one book called Ulysses. This was only about this book, Ulysses. This wasn't about the First Amendment. This wasn't about obscenity laws more broadly. It was just, is this book, Ulysses, obscene or not? And ultimately, the judge says it has literary merit. It's not there just to titillate people. This is a work of art. And so it is protected. But again, that wasn't even a ruling that then spread to other books. It was literally just about one book called Ulysses. Um, So it was a win, but a narrow one. And it wasn't a Supreme Court. It was just a federal judge, a district court judge. So it wasn't like this giant uh, Supreme Court case. You know, thinking about it, uh, as I have been the last two days, uh, it, it did sort of tee up the 1960s. I mean, it, you know, it, okay, the, here, Ulysses is fine. You can't call this as obscene. This is not pornography. But we didn't really get that gate that was opened a bit, I would say then, and not in this gigantic 
Supreme Court precedent way, but uh, open, then was finally fully open, you know, 30 years later. And I think actually the Hayes Code that you were talking about earlier, Kurt, is interesting here because it's notable that the Hayes Code wasn't a law. It wasn't a regulation passed. It was self-censorship by the movie industry. And so even if they were reading into the wind that this Ulysses ruling was going to open the door for knocking down obscenity laws, they were going to do the censorship themselves for marketing reasons, for industry reasons, but that they themselves were involved in self-censorship. So again, it's not quite a, a First Amendment issue. Right. And you had, I think, with Ulysses, well, who's going to read this? Who, who, who's <laughs> yeah. moral? Who is it going to corrupt? Whereas movies, everybody sees those. we got to be careful. Yeah. Um, I, I, Nikki, I think your point about the precedent this set is really important. I mean, you almost get the sense that the effect of this was not oh, this set some new ideas about insanity, but it was more just in future cases, people just said, well, is, is this work of art that we're debating now as obscene as Ulysses or not? You know, it kind of just set this interesting, very specific standard that then people could measure against. Um, that said, I do think whether this ruling set a precedent or at least I got at some ideas, you do see some interesting ideas about how we view obscenity and how we adjudicate obscenity in here. One, I think in particular, is this basic idea of the standard by which something should be measured obscene. And I think for a long time, the standard was kind of like, how would a child view this work? How would the most corruptible person view this work? And then in here, you start to see some of the seeds emerging of an idea of, well, let's take the work on its own merit. What is the intended audience? What is the context in which these obscene pieces are taking place? That feels like a pretty fundamental shift to me, right? Yeah, I mean, that kind of what about the children pearl clutching has been kind of a part of how judges and lawmakers thought about obscenity for a really long time. And it's still used in arguments about obscenity, um, in part because children now have access to pretty much everything. But moving it to an adjudication of the artfulness of the work seems to be a pretty, pretty significant shift. No, I think that's right. It, it, it distinguished clearly between well-intended art and not so well-intended, uh, you know, pornography. And, and, and it did that clearly. And and that is one of those, I know it when I see it, mm-hmm. uh, distinctions that has uh, a commonsensical basis, even if it's hard to encode into law and, and, and jurisprudence. Right. And, you know, throughout the years, throughout the decades, there have been tons of other court rulings, including a Supreme Court ruling about pornography that where you get that phrase, you know it when you see it. Um, Sort of as it stands now, we don't have to get into the weeds of obscenity laws now, but as it stands now, one of the sort of, I think, three main ways that obscenity is codified or, or viewed by the law is this notion of taking the work as a whole and whether it has I think that the phrase is serious, literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So this shift towards just a more holistic understanding rather than, you know, uh, I don't think they were screenshotting passages back then, but, you know, rather than (laughs) taking one little passage and saying, oh, look, here's a masturbation scene. This is obscene. uh, It's this larger context. Right. And, you know, uh, another thing, I mean, I thank you for letting me educate myself. The same day that Potter Stewart famous line about I know it when I see it was in a decision in 1964 in the Supreme Court, that same day, the Supreme Court also said uh, Henry Miller's actually dirty and arousing Tropic of Cancer was was not legally obscene. And that really was, I mean, again, the fact that it's 64, I mean, I, I have written a lot about and thought a lot about the late 60s. It, that was like, okay, that day in 1964 was the day when certainly, and those are both works of art, right? Louis Mal, uh, Henry Miller. But by the end of the decade, you know, you had another work of art in Philip Roth's book, significantly about masturbation as well, uh, Portnoy's Complaint uh, coming out. But and, and, and then the gates were open. And then, you know, the same community standards allowed for thoroughly and only pornographic movies like Deep Throat and others to be legally shown in theaters around America. Yeah. Um, One last question about this ruling, and then I want to get to this larger context um, of the era and the sort of era since. But um, I want to read a quote from Judge Woolsey in in his ruling, and he says, quote, I am quite aware Ulysses is a rather strong draft to ask some sensitive though normal persons to take. But whilst in many places the effect of Ulysses on the reader undoubtedly is somewhat emetic, nowhere does it tend to be an aphrodisiac. Ulysses may therefore be admitted into the United States. So my question to you, Kurt, is who is a denser writer, Judge Woolsey (laughs) or James Joyce? Well, and I had to look up a medic to make sure I, I knew what he too. was talking about. Like, you know, I needed the, the Joyce uh, concordance. So a medic means 
causing vomiting. So <laughs> Ulysses is rather undoubtedly somewhat emetic uh, in the eyes of this judge, but uh, there's a new vocab word for you. No, it's true. And I also, Judge Woolsey as well, by the way, this is the thing he's famous for, but a couple of years earlier, he had also ruled as not obscene a, a, a guide to uh, domestic marital sexuality and, and another one about contraception. So this was, you know, he, he was leading up to this, like, yeah, chill. This yeah. stuff is not going to corrupt the world. But yeah, I mean, he was not the most absolutist <laughs> legal writer. But but on the other hand, that line, as as legal writing with fancy words in it go, is, is, is not is, is better than some. So, Nikki, this larger context, Kurt did mention this just amazing Coincidence or not coincidence, I guess, but that um, that very same week, the 21st Amendment is passed. Um, what should we read into this? Well, first, the 21st Amendment was the end of prohibition. So it was the end of this failed experiment of trying to prohibit alcohol in the United States. And like a lot of these obscenity laws, it had, you know, as we, I said earlier, the, the idea of prohibition had been pushed by progressives, especially by women activists in the early part of the 20th century. And that period was coming to an end. We were entering a new phase of liberalism, one that was less concerned with these ideas of moral censure and vice and more interested in using the state in very different ways for economic intervention and things like that, which, of course, those early progressives won it too. Um, but you see a liberalism that begins to shed some of these concerns about religious morality and vice. Well, yeah. And of course, the anti-Ulysses, anti obscenity forces from the early 20th century, certainly through the 60s and the 70s, was a, a project of the cultural left, right? And libertarianism joined with progressivism to say, you know, anything goes, free speech, marketplace of ideas and all that. And, and then, well, well, you still had that going and you had people like Andre Serrano and Karen Finley and all the rest, the NEA4 having litigation um, over their obscene works of art in the 80s and 90s. You also then had the beginning, once again, as Nikki says, sort of bookending the 20th century of, of the left and of women on the left beginning to talk in restrictionist ways about pornography, for instance, Andrea Dworkin in, in, in the 80s. And then today, in, in ways beyond sexuality or obscenity or pornography or all the rest, we have arrived at a place again where there is more restrictionist talk about free speech uh, on the left than has existed in my life. Yeah, it's something, I mean, you, you mentioned Andrea Dworkin, but also in the 1980s and 1990s on putting warning labels on rap albums and this concern about violence and language that was very much not just bipartisan, but kind of by ideological or cross ideological, where it was conservatives and liberals coming together and joining in these kinds of restrictions. Um, and it's interesting to see how that's reformulating or shifting um, in a new digital culture. Yeah. No, and again, as you say, by ideological bipartisan restriction on speech, Tipper Gore and Jesse Helms at once saying, rap, it's bad. You also had, interestingly, and I don't think unrelatedly, a sort of plunge into total economic libertarianism, right? Like, oh, no, anything goes. We're not going to regulate business, but we are going to regulate speech, you know? Yeah. Um, so, Kurt, I mean, let's end with a little bit of your sense of what lessons there are maybe in this story we're discussing for today or what it makes you think of today. I mean, we are undoubtedly having big conversations about free speech. They are not playing out in the courts yet, as far as I can tell. Right. Well, one thing that, as I see these things playing out in people on social media, which is a place, obviously, things are playing out today in all kinds of ways, is this is censorship, that censorship. I think it's important here when we're talking about something being illegal to publish and distribute in America. That is censorship. The government is preventing it. Whereas, you know, there's it's a question of whether a Facebook or a Twitter, I mean, they are virtual monopolies. And so there are questions of it is censorship-ish, but they are private businesses. So it's it's not the same as censorship. It's not censorship if a whole mob of, of people on social media come and attack you for something you said or did or showed. So I think distinguishing, it is a reason to keep that important distinction clear between government censorship and all the other stuff that is annoying or problematic or whatever it is of quote unquote cancel culture that isn't that. But as we were talking about, I, I think it is related into what is considered 
among respectable people and polite society and stylish and liberal people, what speech should or shouldn't be allowed and that those norms don't go in one direction, you know, that they, that, that, you know, it comes and goes. And so I think people from 1933 would be kind of surprised at what has happened in the last 30 years in this realm. Yeah, I mean, we live in an era after half a century of sort of radical liberalization of free speech jurisprudence. So when it comes to the government, there's very little that the government can actually censor. But when it comes to censuring people um, through sort of social methods, but also then the ways that these companies can restrict or slow down speech, um, that's in some ways kind of a new world, but maybe it harkens back to the Hayes codes and the movie industry, the sort of self-censoring that industries do. Well, and as we try to figure out how, if things like Facebook and, and Twitter should be regulated some way, if they aren't or can't or won't do it themselves, the way the, the motion picture industry did in 1934, what are we going to do? You know, from the American maximize free speech way, that, that would be ideal, but um, it seems like they haven't really given it a good faith attempt and try uh, at, at, at figuring out how to do that. Um, all right. Well, let's leave it there. I hope we don't get to the point where we are uh, printing out tweets and hiding them under our coats as we cross the border like they did with copies of Ulysses in uh, 1933. But uh, this is really fascinating stuff. And um, Kurt, I'm really glad you uh, you joined us. Thank you for doing this. Oh, it was terrific. And, and, and you know, a longtime fan. Uh, first time caller, I guess. Is, so thanks. <laughs> and uh, the new books are Evil Geniuses and Fantasy Land. So go check those out, folks. Nicole Hemmer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Radiotopia is an independent network of independent shows, artist-driven, and often listener-supported. So if you would like to support this show directly, you can do so at thisdaypod.com. There's a form there. You can give a one-time donation. You can become a recurring member. Um, Listener support is a big piece of the pie alongside ad revenue. We really do appreciate all the support from our listeners and this little community we have going. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can find that form at thisdaypod.com or email us thisdaypod at gmail.com. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon.